And you are my wife's lover? No. Then what are you doing here? I know you. You're the guy from the gym. I'm not here representing our bodies. Oh, yes. I know very well what you represent. You represent the idiocy of today. I don't represent that either. Hello, listening people. Hello. Hello, Bartek. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Oh, wow. You're doing weller than me. I'm doing weller than you. I'm no I'm no Peter Weller. I feel I'll like just a... tell you that. I'm not I'm not Robocop. I'm himself. feeling really unfantastic, even though I'm well. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. You're only well while I'm doing fantastic. And the listening people, they're doing spectacular. Maybe even stupendous. Well, mm-hmm. I can accept that. Uh, well, we will accept it. Uh, here on Spit and Polish, we present to you acceptance. It's the final, that's right. That's the final stage of grieving, right? <laughs> they were going to say it's the final solution, and I was really <laughs> going to be like, well, I guess so. In the Acceptance bad... <laughs> is a final solution. If he succeeded, I mean, we'd have to accept it. We'd... <laughs> we, 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 well, it happened. We can't deny it. We can't. Well, some would. There's lots of deniers <laughs> out there. Holocaust succeeding deniers. Oh, you said the thing out loud. I didn't say it out loud. Well, I you was, said final solution. I, yeah, but I didn't say the H word. Oh, no. Now we're going to get demonetized. You know we got demonetized for our Lemonade Joe uh, episode on YouTube just because we talked about Czechoslovakia and oh, communism. But Yeah, and I'll, I mentioned to you the other week, oh, we didn't get demonetized for Mean Creek where I said slurs. Well, it's okay because today here on the podcast we are doing our show Pictures Power Wow where we talk about a movie that has come recommended and the film we are doing today does involve those rascally Russians and... Vladimir Putin did make an appearance in this movie. Is, sorry, did is, you see that? Yes. Is this episode already demonetized? It's already. <laughs> yeah, we've already. You already said the H word. That's right. He already no, said, said the H word. No, I said hologram. Oh, a different type of hollow. Fun fact: I learned ho- the word hologram before Holocaust. Oh, oh, well, I would hope so. Mm. I guess I. You know, I don't think there's a correct order of learning those words. No, but no, definitely there is. We are not talking I'm about special. Schindler's List. We are actually talking about Burn After Reading, uh, a film that also deals with a lot of heavy topics. But unlike that, unlike that Spielbergo, those Coen brothers. They're funny. Funny's funny. There's, what can I say? There's twice, this is, twice as many of them, too. This is a comedy film, or is it? Uh, the Coen brothers are well-known directors, and they cover a wide array of tones and genres and style, and yet you always know it's a Coen brothers film. Like They, they have a certain way of doing things that you just know and burn after reading is a film that was recommended by you the listening people that's right you the listening people can recommend movies to us we add them to the list and then we eventually get around to them and Bartek do you remember who suggested this film I can't remember the username but it was a, it was a YouTube uh YouTube account mm-hmm. um and I think it was in our Doctor Strange Love comments This was by our good friend an honest doubter That's right They honestly I doubt. remember I remember you liked the name I honestly love the name and I doubt it too but they said do burn after reading and if they said it on the Doctor Strange Love uh, episode, it makes sense. You can see the parallels here, for sure, mm. in which you get these, you know, fairly well-regarded, acclaimed, serious directors, you know, Stanley Kubrick and the Coens, uh, who are known for being maybe a little bit emotionally distant in some of their works, giving us a farcical romp about bureaucracy and the government and so many other strands that we can pull at and Burn After Reading, how would you even describe it to someone, Bartek? Someone who has never seen Burn After Reading, but you're trying to convince them to watch it so that way they can listen to the rest of the podcast without getting spoiled. How would you do that? Uh, so Burn After Reading is about... it's It's got a little bit of an ensemble cast who are all... Uh, they're all doing their own things in life, but there's like connections between them. Um, and then... Uh, an event that happens to one of the characters, uh, sorry, and, and each of the characters have events going on in their lives 
or in their relationships and everything starts to kind of meld together, paths get crossed, um, and a lot of, uh, I guess, hijinks ensue. It's a comedy of errors. Very much so, yeah. But it's also bundled up in a political thriller. Mm. <laughs> and Burn After Reading is a film that I have seen before. But what about you? Have you seen this before? Are you familiar? Do you, do you have any history with this? No, this is one of a million films where I've heard the title but don't really know much about it. So, so, you, so you didn't know anything going in? Not really, no. When you mentioned it was by the Coen brothers, that got me excited because we've done a couple of Coen brothers films on the podcast before and I haven't really seen too many of them and each one, you know, has been really pleasant. Ah, uh, now I am a Coen brothers fan. I, I Some some of my favourite movies are Coen brothers movies. That's not unusual for people who like films to say uh, I was really excited to see Burn After Reading. I saw those trailers at the time. It seemed like a really funny thing. They emphasized Brad Pitt and Francis McDormand's characters. Oh, they've stumbled across some government thing and they're going to try and blackmail their way into, you know, fame and fortune, but things aren't going to go well for them. Oh, what a jolly good time this shall be. I can't wait. And then I saw the film... And I hated it, <laughs> and I've never seen it since until now. Oh, okay, so this is a first mm -hmm, time revisit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just remembered part of my dissatisfaction was it was so disparate. It was just all of these different characters and stories, and yeah, they connected, but I was just kind of left there not caring about any one of them. Mm. The more I wanted to care about a character, we would just go away from them. Oh, I want to like Francis McDormand's character. I want to love Brad Pitt's character. But then we just go back to George Clooney and his and his life. Or, well, we go back to John Malkovich, who I, I, I will say as well, and still to this day, John Malkovich is not an actor I like very much. He always plays John Malkovich, hence there's a film about that. I don't like his delivery. I don't like his screen presence. So it's like, oh, now we're going to have to cut back to John Malkovich and his bitchy wife and this and this. And people really love John Malkovich. Like there's some of the highest viewed videos about this movie is just him swearing because that's where he does. He swears really well. And I just don't vibe with that. Mm. So there was just a level of, I, I don't know, just... I was despondent to the film, and I remember there was a few at that time of Coen Brothers that in my younger days I didn't really gel with, or I gelled with some of it and not all of it, like No Country for Old Men I really like, uh, but when I saw it originally, it really lost me in the second half of the film. Uh, I've seen it again, and I still like the movie, but I still have that lingering, like, eh, I like the first half more, but... There's always that kind of uh, relationship with me with some of the Coen Brothers movies where there's like strong aspects of it I love and then other bits I just really don't like. Mm. But this was one in which I just went, I, I didn't like that and I've never had the urge to revisit it over the years. People have talked about it very fondly. Oh, it's one of their funniest films. Oh, what an underrated gem. Oh, the ending. The ending is one of the funniest endings I've ever seen to a movie because it points out that the movie was pointless and meaningless. I'm like, oh, how funny. Oh, uh, Stroke your chin. Like, The more time went on, the more disinterested I was because the narrative of the movie being spun by the fans of it or filmgoers was just making me more like yes yes i get it they're oh so clever you, you just that yeah. that kind of like resistance to uh it's like how it's like how i feel about wes anderson films nowadays where it's like the more people talk about wes anderson films the less inclined i want to watch them because the more annoying they I sound and yet i've liked wes anderson movies that's kind of the risk you have with auteur directors where it's like oh yeah they they've made high quality things before but you know you you have such a strong idea of who they are that you, you, I guess, put on, you interpret a bit of like narcissism from mm. them. It's like, oh, yeah, I can do this and it's great. Like, we, we kind of talked about the opposite last episode with Larry Crown, um, where we both said, like, hey, this is a really, you know, prestigious, prolific actor guy who's made this film and we don't, we don't put any sort of venom towards him for this film that could potentially be described as a um, vanity project. Vanity project. I, I forgot the phrase, and you got me right there. Um, yeah, we didn't put that on there. So it's interesting that now we're following that up with like you know 
the auteur directors, the Coen brothers. And it's very much a Coen brothers film. Mm. I could relate this to many of their previous works and say it's like the Big Lebowski in this moment, or it's like this in this moment and this and that moment. I think this is like the third one we've done where a major character is Mm. uh, like a husband in a bad marriage that's falling apart. Yeah. Was that it, William H. Macy's situation? Yeah, that was Fargo. Fargo. Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. was a piece of shit who yeah. needed money. And then uh, there's. Our Australian boy. Uh, of yes, of course. And now we're here with Burn After Reading. I've gone over my history with it, but tell us about your feelings of the movie. This is your first time. You didn't know much other than who the directors were. Mm. So did you have a feeling of like anything beforehand? Like, oh, it's going to be Coen Brothers. Will this be one of their comedies or dramas or anything going on? I, I think you did say last episode that it was a black comedy. Mm. And I forgot that element, but I did remember that you said it was a comedy at the very least. So I basically just walked in, you know, with high hopes, like, oh, this is it's Coen Brothers. So, you know, there'll be something to grasp onto there and it'll be a good time. So I walked in very optimistic. And what are your thoughts on Burn After Reading? And I walked out pretty happy. I actually had a decent time with it. It um, it, It's one of these ones where, um, I guess in the past, I, I've joked about how I've watched certain films for the podcast and I guess didn't get it or like something completely went over my head until the very end. I think that kind of happened in this one where I wasn't really getting that, like, everything amounts to, you know, being pointless or mm-hmm. or completely ridiculous. I was, like, just following along as it was happening. I'm like, oh, it's interesting. Oh, the webs are connecting. Like, I was actually kind of too sucked into the film, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so when it ended on that note, I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I guess it is. The All these characters made bad decisions and are all dumb and kind of stuff like that. Um, no, yeah, it reminded me of a couple of other films we've done. It It didn't have the same... And we've talked about this in both times we've talked about it, but in Oscar, how... um The Sylvester Stallone comedy film Oscar. Yeah, where well, that was also like a sort of ensemble film where there's like all these different characters and different positions and they're, you know, crossing paths and uh, it's all set in like a short period of time and like hijinks, uh, you know, happen where something is set up when you meet this one character and gets paid off way later when he interacts with another character. Um, that happened a little bit in this film and I, and I did like how... At the beginning, like, when we were cutting to different characters, like, what did any of these characters have to do with each other? And there was, like, an actual, like, web you could follow at the end. Mm-hmm. There was a Venn, you know, Venn diagram and all this stuff. Of, oh, this person crosses mm. over and this, this, this. Yes, Burn After Reading. I enjoyed it a lot more on this watch mm-hmm. as well. I love George Clooney in Coen Brothers films. I love George Clooney in general. He's not. I don't think he's a good actor. I think he's a great entertainer. Mm. There are examples where he's a fantastic actor, but I think George Clooney, and I've t- discussed this in an intolerable cruelty to, uh, in episode, but he has a certain persona and certain way of acting, the the famous like head wobble that he does, the big smiles. He often like retracts his mouth in a weird way, and he just has a lot of quirks. Uh, but I think the Coen brothers utilize him really well because they know the most important facet to George Clooney, which is make him an idiot. Mm. In each version of their films, he's a different type of idiot. Think back to Intolerable Cruelty, where he's the lead. He's also an idiot in that movie, a vain idiot. Yeah. In this one, he is just a stupid guy who just keeps skating on by on th- just pure charm, but he's also like a neurotic weirdo that nobody yeah. respects or likes. I think, I think I've talked about it with him before in the past, and this kind of relates to something I talked about again last episode, where growing up, I don't, don't think I'd ever seen him in anything, but I knew who he was just because, you know, he's he's a big A-lister that you would point to in Hollywood. Referenced in Reference media. Referenced in things. That, that, and that's what I was talking about last time, how in Goldmember, I knew who Julie Roberts was because, like, oh, the Dr. Eve, the, number two mentioned her as mm-hmm. a big celebrity that they have on board, so that means they're good. And I think George Clooney was literally the first one he mentioned. So it was like, oh, yeah, there's this, you know, handsome, prolific actor guy, and I see him on ads for, you know, watches and, I guess, coffee sometimes. Mm-hmm. I bet, you know, he's just going to be like a generic, you know, rich, happy... Smug man. Smug man. But then I see him in things where they use him well, and it's like, this guy's actually really funny. He is really funny. The Coen brothers humble him, because there are films, and I I enjoy the Oceans movies for sure, but the Oceans movies can be very guilty of 
No, he is fucking cool. In none of the Coen Brothers movies is George Clooney cool. <laughs> yeah. He's a fucking dope. You Coen Brothers and Train Parker. Yeah, 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 yeah. The South Park guys know how to use him. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, the, the Coens know how. You haven't seen... Trey a... and Parker. Yeah, Trey and Parker. I got you. But uh... Parker and Stone. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Trey and Parker. <laughs> but uh, you haven't seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? No. Ah, you would love him in that. He It's like 1920s or 30s America, and he's like playing the ultimate Clark Gable type, but he's a fucking idiot. Mm-hmm. He has his hair gel he's always putting on. <laughs> it's great. It's just a whole Dapper Dan hair gel, and he's he's so obsessed with his hair in that movie. But I liked Burn After Reading a lot more. I was more appreciative of all of the connecting plot threads and how it's just a bunch of idiots. Like, no one is actually a smart person in this movie. Like, no main proper character. I'm not going to include George Clooney's wife. Like, she's barely in the movie. But Mm. even Tilda Swinton, who comes across as the most put-together individual. Yeah, I was thinking of her as you were talking. She rarely sees through the smokescreen of George Clooney's obvious facade. She, She knows he's an idiot, but she still thinks, well, he's going to leave his wife and come with me. And yet she doesn't see, like, what every other person in the movie sees, which is clearly he's just a fucking wandering dick playboy guy who's just sleeping with any woman. Like, he's using the website to pick up chicks. Tilda Swinton just doesn't... She doesn't see that part mm. of this character somehow. She still sees that he's, like, inept, but she still doesn't see yeah, she's, that she, this won't work. She's dumb in the full context. Like, if you isolate... If you only played clips of her in the film, it's like, oh, yeah, she's, you know, put-together character, but then you, you know, show everything happening around her and how she's not getting it, and it's like, oh, okay, yep, this is also one of the dumb characters. Since we're talking about Tilda Swinton, I want to just praise her. She's She's fantastic in this movie. My favorite comedic scene came from her, and I, I I completely forgot about this because, again, in my recollection, this is the Brad Pitt movie. Brad Pitt stole the film. Whenever you look up images, it's Brad Pitt. It's all Brad Pitt. Even his death scene is a memorable scene with the big smile that he has. But Tilda Swinton is so good in this. When we cut to her and see what her job is, <laughs> like near the end of the film... We see her as a doctor looking after a child and the way she talks to this child. <laughs> and she's got, like, the stethoscope on and it's got, like, a little toy because it's show you that she deals with children. Mm. And she's, like, the most mean, cold-hearted British <laughs> bitch ever. And she's like, if you don't do what I tell you to do right now, I'll make your mother leave and then you will do it. And then she wheels over and grabs the phone and she's like, I've got a patient right now. I laugh so much at that because, again... This character has been such a like icy person throughout the thing. Uh, uh, hey, there's a little bit of a fun joke there because she was the ice queen and the uh, lion witch in the wardrobe, Tilda Swinton. Mm-hmm. But Tilda Swinton often plays very, you know, harsh characters. She She's a versatile actress, but if you get her as prim, proper bitch... She does really well, and she's doing that here. And so you spend the whole movie of her being, like, the most cynical character, the most, like, cutting character. Cut to her job. She's a (laughs) pediatrician. She's she's a pediatrician, (laughs) and she doesn't have a different mode for it. Mm. I laughed so much during that. Like, as soon as I saw that stethoscope, I started giggling. I'm like, oh, God. Because I can't imagine this character doing this job, but here we are watching her do this job. Um, Do you want to hear a trivia fact about Tilda Swinton? Yes, I do. So she has a very specific haircut in this film. And (laughs) I don't know where this came from, but apparently, according to the trivia out there, she styled it after a very specific character, a cartoon character. Mm Mm-hmm. Mrs. Krabappel from oh, The Simpsons. Yes, I did read that trivia point, actually. Why? <laughs> like, <laughs> so the characters are comparable, but why? I, I I love it. It's such a strange choice, Tilda. And that Tilda Swinton is one of the only, or the only, like, lead character uh, that the, like, the Cohen had in mind each character who the actor would be except for Tilda Swinton. She was like the oddball. Everyone else got cast, like Brad Pitt will be this guy, and, you know, John Malkovich will be this guy, and, you know, Francis McDormand will be this. 
Except for Tilda Swinton. It's like, oh, and then we got Tilda Swinton to be this one. Like, we didn't have her in mind, but oh, yeah, it's Tilda Swinton. She's always good. And it's like, she was really good. <laughs> she she gets the humor of being the stick in the mud in this film, and mm. I appreciated it. And it's so strange that she gets so little screen time with John Malkovich, who's also the other stick in the mud in this movie. <laughs> but I appreciated they're, they're, her a lot. Their first scene together, yeah, really spelled out who those characters were. It's like, I've got news for you. And it's like, did you get the cheese? You didn't get the cheese? i got to get the cheese. <laughs> I like later when he was trying to explain why he couldn't explain earlier why he quit his job and she's like, oh, okay. So then then what happened after that? Did you get aphasia or something? Like, did it just pop out of your brain? Did it while we were having all of those hours in between? And he's like, no, we had guests over. Oh, really? Immediately did we have guests. It's just, I could... That was really... I like that scene. It had a faulty Towers vibe, hmm. those two characters. They had a faulty Towers dynamic <laughs> between them. But... Uh, tell me a bit about the things that worked for you since you had a positive experience with the film. Yeah, you know, I haven't actually seen John Malkovich in too much, as far as I'm aware. Um, and he's got this look about him. So as soon as I saw him, it was like, oh, okay, we're in sort of a weird place here. And his the way his way of speaking was very enunciated. So I can definitely see what you were saying before about how um, uh, a lot of people grasp onto like him swearing in this film. How it's very emphasised. It kind of reminds me of. Um, when we, we've talked in the past about uh, Christoph Waltz, mm-hmm. how he's got a very emphasized way of talking. Um, I Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed seeing him in the film. It just led itself to the sort of weirdness to it. And really, every time he responded to something, uh, a lot of people say about this film that everyone makes stupid decisions all the time. Mm-hmm. With his, whenever he made a decision or like he reacted to something, it would always be like really aggressive. Yeah, I was gonna say over the top, but over the top in a sort of restrained way with an with an aggression to it. So all of those moments like really stuck out. Like when he was being blackmailed and he very quickly turned, you know, on the phone while his wife's mm. asleep, very quickly turned to yelling and swearing. <laughs> And even just Brad Pitt's reactions to that. He was another element that really worked for me. Oh, when he punched Brad Pitt in the face suddenly, and then they're both (laughs) sitting there in the wake of that being like, well, that just happened. Wow, that just (laughs) happened, huh? And then John Malkovich getting incredulous when they hit his car. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's just, just, you can't get away with this. And they're just like, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Fuck you. And then Brad Pitt remembers, oh, we've got to go back to my bike. There 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 were some laughs had from the way John Malkovich pronounces things. I specifically like, and, and you can tell the Coen brothers either directed him to say it like this, or they knew his specific accent would do this. He's writing a memoir. Hmm. And the way he says memoir throughout this entire movie is so bizarre. He's often, he's always calling it like, memoir. Yes, I'm writing memoir. And just, <laughs> even Tilda Swin's like, what? There's one point where she asks, what? And he's like, you know, memoir. And she's like, oh, yes, 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 of course. Like, she just doesn't care. But it's just like, even she gets caught up in, what was that? <laughs> like, just, he says things in a very peculiar manner. And it's like, if you found, like, at least with Christoph Waltz, he's, he's from a different country. Hmm. English isn't his first language. Same with Mads Mikkelsen. John Malkovich, I'm, English is his first language, I'm pretty sure. And he sounds like he's from a different planet a lot of the times. And it can be very distracting in other films where you're supposed to take him seriously. In this one, you're not supposed to take him seriously at any point. Mm. Like, he's never genuinely intimidating. He's he's just like, it's kind of funny that he's getting so angry because we know that these are uh, fools he's dealing with. And so does he. He's, he's always calling them idiots throughout mm. the film. He's always calling them, like, in over their heads, but he's well, still reacting that's part, so that's, angrily. And that's kind of part of his characterization. Like, he he sees himself as the main character of, you know, everything that's happening and everyone who is acting, uh, everyone who's doing something that isn't him is like, what are they doing? This is stupid. What, this is ridiculous. You got this guy in here? He's a Mormon, you know? <laughs> Everyone's a drinker compared to him. He's like, this guy's a dick. This person's an idiot. But then the irony is, you know, he's not the brightest bulb in the shed. The film makes you think he's the lead character as well. Mm. They start with him. There's intrigue. Why did he lose his job? Is that really the reason? What's he going to do now? Oh, no, he's writing a memoir. What's this going to lead to? Now, oh, no, now it's Frances McDormand. Now she's the lead character. And John Malkovich get, 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 barely gets anything to do mm. in the movie. He's and then, oh, now it's George Clooney. And, like, 
And you can see there are moments where it's almost like his character is getting frustrated that the narrative has been taken away from him. I mean, literally, he's upset that his memoir has been taken away by other people. Uh, <laughs> just, just very silly. And I like later on when the CIA, no, when the Russians, sorry, have been given the material and they don't know it's a memoir. They're just like, I was just drivel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not well written for the Russians. Uh, fun fact number two. For us on this podcast, we used to host a show called The Mystery Box. Did you expect this to come up, Bartek? No, but I like The, the Mystery, Mystery Box. Box so go ahead, and one of our it. favorite films was Stardust. No, not that Stardust. Another one. The good one. In which a lead character is played by a Polish actor. Yeah, the Oleg Krupa. Who was in Miller's Crossing mm -hmm. as a bartender. We made sure to keep an eye out for him and we saw him. He has a much more prominent role in this film. Yeah, he's one of the Russian embassy he's guys, right? He's the Russian embassy guy mm. who's like, this is drivel. He's the <laughs> one that's the most dis curt and most upfront and he gets most scenes. And I immediately went, hey, it's the dad from Stardust. I knew him immediately because he was like, oh, he's been in Coen Brothers movies before. That's right. I saw his face and went, oh, it's him because he has a similar hairstyle. And I'm like, it's mm. the dad from, it's from Stardust. And now he's playing the Russian that she keeps mispronouncing his name. <laughs> and you could tell he got annoyed at that more and more during the film. No, I, I missed that it was him, oh, unfortunately. Tragic. Now, you're a Brad Pitt fan. I've enjoyed him too, yeah. He's he's often a great time, especially when working with big auteur directors like your Tarantinos, for instance. We used to do a podcast called Unappreciated Masterpieces, and we did one of his first films on that one. Cutting Class. And you, you, you mentioned Cutting Class, you know, or at least you evoked it, and uh, we should say, we haven't said it, but... Martin Mull, the actor, passed away a little while ago. The dad from Cutting Class with the mm. famous title drop line. Yeah. Truly sad. Like, what a one, what of the great character actors. I don't know if he ever did a Coen Brothers movie, but he should have. He did. Martin Mull have a crossover with George Clooney. They were both on Roseanne. Because that's where George Clooney kind of got his start, was in sitcoms. Okay, yeah. So and then he did ER and then he did all these movies. But Brad Pitt. What did you feel about Brad Pitt? Because he's like George Clooney as well, where it's like handsome yeah. actor man with a lot of baggage that comes from their persona, you know, Brangelina and Mr. and Mrs. Smith and all of this. But how did you feel about what he got to do? I liked him in this. Uh, it, it kind of evoked cutting class a little bit because uh, he wasn't playing like big, cool, tough guy sort of thing. Uh, he was playing kind of... Not dweeby, but like a d dumb guy, a really dumb uh, exercise bro who goes to the gym. He works at the gym, um, and he, uh, I, I guess a lot of people say that this film is kind of like a black comedy uh, anti-take on spy films or mm -hmm. espionage films. And this is a character who kind of wants to be in that plot with the situation he found himself in. He's kind of saying, dude, bro, yeah, you found this, uh, you know, CIA secrets on this CD in the in the locker room. We got We can make money off this thing by, you know, blackmail or, or giving it to the Russian He wants to be a good kind of. Samaritan. Yeah. And then he doesn't understand why it's being misconstrued as blackmail. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, contain your shit. Hmm. <laughs> And in Cutting Class, you know, he played a teenager in that, so he, he had, and not a a teenager without a good reputation, so he mm -hmm. also kind of had like a bit of a dumb element there, and I saw that being evoked in this. He's very good at playing dumb characters who, because of their, because of his looks, is considered to be an alpha male. That's why I love him in Inglorious Bastards, where he's so dumb. Or a Derchi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bon Giorno. Bon Giorno. Um, <laughs> yeah, talk about Christoph Waltz. And, <laughs> um, you know, he's such an idiot in, the, in that film, uh, but he's so delightful to watch because he's got the Brad Pitt handsome guy look to him. So it's like everyone trusts him. Like everyone's like, oh, we should, including us, the audience, oh, we should follow into him because yeah. it's Brad. Look at him. He's, he, he's an all American boy. Yeah, and he plays, I guess, a bit more of a chill version in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Where... Oh, and that one, he's very stoic. Uh, stoic. I think more chill, I guess. I think stoic. Uh, he's He goes through a journey in that film. In my memory, I just, he's, you know, like kind of not too enthusiastic, kind of sleepy mm. guy, but like, you know, really chill, likes his dog, likes to just hang out. 
he well once upon a time in hollywood's another discussion because they also have the reveal of why he is like that in his past that kind of colors everything about his character <laughs> that they don't really touch upon ever again like, in the I, movie yeah, I, I guess i need to rewatch. but this one. <laughs> i love brad pitt in this this is one of my favorite brad pitt performances i keep saying why don't the current brothers use brad pitt all of the time he's so <laughs> damn funny in so, this so, just to jump back on your first viewing did you also feel that way i loved brad pitt yeah and, like i love brad pitt and francis mcdormand they were my favorite parts of the film and i wanted more time spent with them and I still feel that way a little bit. I love both of them. I mean, Francis McDormand is always great. Uh, Fargo was obviously one of the best films ever, and she's great in Fargo. And she brings that kind of you know Fargo esque energy to this role, but different, obviously. But you know that oh geez, oh for Pete's sake, she says that in both films mm. when things are not going well and she's in a car. And I just like her as a performer, but teaming her up with Brad Pitt, <laughs> and they're just these two gym people who are doing this for very selfish and vain reasons, but they believe that they're good I like people. That, I like that the film introduces her with her big motivation. It tells you right up front, like, this is what this character cares about. This is what this scene's about. After this scene, put her out in the world and see what happens. We love movies that have eccentric character actors or side characters in films. Mm. And the Coen brothers, you can always rely on them for for their dramas and their comedies to have those weird people in their films. Like, think to this one, Tilda Swinton's lawyer, her divorce attorney guy who's constantly being like, Give it another day. Give it another piece of thought. He's just so strange. Just like everything about him is just a little bit weird. And he's like a portly guy. And he, he speaks in a very clipped tone of voice. And the Coen brothers always have those people in their movies. Like, have you ever watched uh, No Country for Old Men? No, I haven't. You know of it, though. Yeah. And you know of you know, the famous, like, coin flip scene. It's, like, one of the big scenes. Well, there's... Is that the scene where he goes to, like, a petrol station yes, or something? Yes, he goes to convenience I, I think store, I watched petrol... that at school, yeah. yeah. And there's that guy. He was in a bunch of stuff still, but there's, like, that actor guy. And it's, like, they always get these type of people in their films all of the time, like M.M. M. at Walsh or whoever this actor of The Lawyer is. Or, or think back to talking about The Lawyer, Intolerable Cruelty filled to the brim with these kind of like eccentric, weird mm. side characters who aren't given funny lines of dialogue per se, but they're just kind of, as described in Fargo, kind of funny looking. Yeah. And it just brings a certain I, Yeah, I remember Intolerable, Intolerable Cruelty had the bailiff who was played by the, the monotone talking teacher from Saved by the Bell. That was really funny. And of course, uh, the, the the head of the firm in uh, Intolerable Cruelty, the old man who was decrepit and dying and he had a tube out of his chest that was just squirting with goo out of it. something like that, yeah. <laughs> and he's just like this turtle-looking guy screaming all the time. He was in one scene and it was shot like a horror film, only for that scene, though. <laughs> but this one has a bunch of those, like, hey, it's... Like, you may not recognize them or you may not remember from what film you've seen them, but you're like, oh, it's that person. Like, they must have been in something like... The when George Clooney tackles the person that's been following him throughout the entire movie. Yeah. Oh, it's that nerdy guy. I've seen that nerdy guy in something or other. I, I could look it up, and I'm sure he's been like 50 things I've seen, but I'm like, oh, it's that dweeb. So when he's constantly reiterating that, no, I don't work for your wife. Your wife hired the firm who then hired me. And he's always <laughs> saying the name of the firm. <laughs> like it matters. Yeah. And then when George Clooney's like, are they lawyers? Are they lawyers? He's like, oh, you know, actually, they're they're no, of band. course they're lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you hear the name? Like, he, he's incredulous. And, he, yeah, and, he, and he, he didn't have that big tone of sarcasm to it. It's like, no, they're a band. Of course they're a law firm. <laughs> and if you're going to have character actors, if you're going to have weird, quirky people on the side, or if you're going to have anyone... You hire Richard Jenkins. Richard Jenkins is the man, and he's here as uh, as the manager, I guess, of Hard Bodies, the gym, the one mm. that's 
obviously in love with Francis McDormand and, and fucking dies brutally. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not here representing hard bodies was also another line I very much enjoyed. <laughs> but Richard Jenkins, you've seen him in everything. He was the dad and stepbrothers. He was he was in um Witches of Eastwick as the suffering husband of the crazy woman in town. And like he's in everything. It's yeah, like, I, oh, it's Richard Jenkins. I love Richard Jenkins. Yeah, I got stuck in him. I kept thinking, like, oh, is that the is that Ted's dad from Bill and Ted? No, like no, it's not. And I was it's getting, the other guy. And I was getting extra stuck on it because the character's name is Ted. <laughs> of course, of yeah. course. But Richard Jenkins, delightful. He's like the most morally pure character in the film, and mm. he's still an idiot. <laughs> well, yeah, he's even introduced. You know, they're they're watching, they're looking at what's on the CD, and he's like, I, I don't want any part of this. What do you feel about we? The Coen Brothers do this a lot, like in Fargo, where the film has a clear like moral code and message to it. But there's all of this kind of nihilism and violence and meaninglessness around it where it makes you question, like, is the moral a joke in itself? Like in Fargo, you have Margie as like our main character. And she's just like she's seen all of it and she's like, I just don't get it. You know, like because she's such a good it's a, person. It's a speech at the end. Yes. Right? And, and then you get Rich Jenkins character who's speaking like the truth throughout the whole movie is like, you shouldn't be defining yourself by this, or we shouldn't be going down this. And then he gets the most brutal death of the film. Like the film like fucking murders his, the voice of reason. Mm. And we end on the film being like, guess there was no point to any of this, huh? <laughs> like, what do you feel about that? Cause that's been like a recurring thing throughout some of the Coen brothers we've done of just, there's this kind of wrestling match that they put in there of hope and nothingness or like despair mm. or meaninglessness or nihilism or what do you feel i guess because the film has such a sense of humor i didn't quite feel the the despair or nihilism or whatever you want to call it too much um i guess i was by the end kind of thinking of it very similar to um when we did uh, very bad things mm. where it's like oh, a lot of these characters are you know not good people and you're seeing you know, the comeuppance of their actions or, you know, their circumstances and the film plays it off as a joke. I didn't see that as being like a, you know, super deep satire of anything. I did just kind of see it as like, oh, you know, let's just do something really kind of absurd or funny. I think it's there a bit because the humor comes from how disposable everything is. Hmm. Brad Pitt's one of your most likable, goofy main characters. He gets shot in the face and the first course of action is, oh, just burn the body. No, no, Off no, screen. anything. Yeah, no, yeah, he's done. And the movie is then left lingering in the aftermath of that. And then it's just like they keep doing that. It's like, well, off screen, this character's conclusion kept going. You didn't see it because that's not important to you right now. Like, what's that? He went to, yeah, what's that? George Clooney tried to go to, was it Venezuela? Mm. Why did he try and do that? Oh, he did that. Oh, let him go. <laughs> let him go. What's that? She wants money. I'll pay her. Don't give a shit. Just, just get this done and dusted. Like, I feel like the way characters are handled and morality itself is handled in the movie is like that of the cold-hearted bureaucracy of the CIA, mm. where they're just like, put it in a file, put it in a box and store it away. We just move on from that. Like, Richard Jenkins is like the nicest character in the film, and he's getting to this point where he's doing the thing, he's following in Brad Pitt's footsteps, and he gets fucking murdered. <laughs> real hard for it and then we just cut away to then the end of the movie being like yeah so that guy died I and guess, then I guess... we had to shoot we had to shoot john malkovich and you see he's in a coma he probably won't make it no brain function but you know yeah, we'll his, rea wait. his reaction to he got shot is like oh good great great, great yeah no he's <laughs> not okay well we'll deal with that when that happens i guess i guess the film was just so consistent in that mm -hmm. tone that i didn't really necessarily feel the darkness like when we talked about uh the hunt that film begins, you know, in a really, really like upbeat, almost wholesomey ways. You know, he's a kindergarten teacher. He, he's friends with like a billion people. He gets along great with the student. And then like the pedophilia accusation happens and everything goes to shit. And you really have that contrasting point from the beginning to the climax. And even in the ending where things look better, it's still very dark. Oh, of course. Whereas in this, it's like always kind of this little bit of a jokey tone. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's still very funny despite oh, yeah, the darkness. Like, it, it, Ted is a good guy. It's sad that he died, 
but he's in this film, so... Exactly. Yeah. No, no, I don't know disputing that. I just think no, it's interesting that they have both at the same time. And what does that mean? Because in Fargo, it's much more like an overt point of just like, you know, oh, all of this snow and despair and all of this... It's all for nothing because, you know, we should be in, you know, more of a community and friendly and whatnot. And then Fargo is two worlds bashing at each other. And then in this movie, it's just like, well, this is a story about a bunch of idiots. And yeah, that's what life is, isn't it? Mm. You ever think about how life's like, uh, you know, the government and uh, the industry and everything's kind of like idiots all the way down, huh? How does that make you feel? You want to have a laugh at that? You think you're better? Huh? You think you're better at home? Mm-hmm. What did we learn here? Like, there is a part of, there is a slight fuck you antagonism of the movie to end by basically giving you the middle finger saying you thought there was a point. That was funny. Fuck you. There's no point. I found that you, funny, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing to take away from this. Go home. J- zoom J- out. J.K. Simmons has a very blasé attitude to everything. Like, he wasn't there for any of the events. He's just hearing about it and just trying to follow along like he's read the synopsis or, or a summary, rather. I love J.K. Simmons. He's so good in everything, isn't he? Mm. He's just he's always a delight. He's he was, always he was great in The Snowman. He was great. In, oh, I mean, his accent work. <laughs> Wasn't he great? He was so fun. He was having, he was having fun. Mm-hmm. Somebody had to in that movie. No, he was good in The Snowman. He was great. I loved his English accent. Oh, hello I loved his ac- I loved his accent in Jennifer's Body. Oh, my God. Don't remind me about him in that. He was so good. <laughs> Especially in the cutscene version of the movie where there's more of him being a freak. <laughs> But, uh, but after reading, I want to also just say that a, a sequence that really, you know, leapt out at me was George Clooney's weird uh, pastime, his little hobby that he has going on. Oh, right. On he's, in- <laughs> he's building a project in his basement and it's, you know, a secret from his wife. He's even got, like, iron gates down in the basement so she can't get into, like, the part where it is. They draw this out for a good time in the movie. Mm. What did you think of that? <laughs> I That was, it was funny. It was a very absurd, unexpected thing. Why? <laughs> it's so strange. I know the reason why in the trivia, but it's such a peculiar thing to throw in there because George Clooney's, like, in the movie, contextually, he is hot. Like, they're not doing yeah. the, oh, he's not hot. He is hot. Everyone thinks he's sexy in this movie. Uh, but then he has, like, this weird, like... And it's even framed like it's a creepy loser thing, but also it's kind of... It's framed as funny, but, like, the way that the basement is lit, like, the shot of what it is, and just... just It's kind of framed like this is something a loser would make. Mm. But it's George Clooney who contextually is a hot, cool guy in this, yeah, but he's it's... also an idiot. I just love like the weird juxtaposition of like him being like, look what I made. And it's just this, this, this sex bed, like sex chair thing with a dildo. And he's like explaining like hundred dollars. Well, except yeah, for the dildo. Yeah, Those dildo, things cost dildo a lot. Dildo piston thing. The, yeah. the, the dildos, they cost a lot. <laughs> like having to clarify, <laughs> like, look, like it costs a hundred dollars, except for the dildo. That costs a lot more actually. It's like, okay. Thank you. No, it was funny. And the way when it was the blanket was over, it's like, oh, it's like a motorcycle that this man is like working on. It's like a project that he does in his garage or, or some secret government thing because he's also like a government guy. Yeah, he's like guy. an ex-US marshal or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I never had to fire my gun in 20 years. Huh? Never, huh? never discharged it. Never yeah. discharged it. You know? But, he, but yeah. he's got. The, he's trained to pull it out. It's, it's a habit, you know, a reflex. Comes out mm. at you. It's a Chekhov's reflex. Yeah. Good payoff to that. Great payoff to that. But Rest in peace, Brad Pitt. I loved the sad montage of characters reaching their low point, and one of those examples is George Clooney angrily destroying his sex chair. I loved that. I had a big <laughs> laugh at that. Just, it's just so absurd. It's George. He's so hot, and there he is destroying this fucking goofy sex chair that he made. And, and he saw him throughout the whole movie get parts to get the sex chair. Yes, like, that's oh, right. It was the building up to it. meticulous lead in to the sex chair. I like that his shot ended on him finally hitting the dildo. Oh, that was... The... <laughs> <laughs> He's so... And also his conditions kept changing. Did you notice that? Like his medical conditions, it was like, 
First it was a lactose thing. Mm. Then it was a shellfish thing. And I think there was like another one in the uh, got, like kept... just a bunch of like neurotic allergies yeah, or something. Yeah, he kept changing them throughout throughout the film. I yeah. it's like, is he telling the truth or does he just have a multitude of fucked up things it's, it's, wrong yeah. with him? It's all things to, you know, build onto his whole paranoia. Now, what did you feel about the swearing in the film because this is something I mentioned at the start, but people often really love the humorous swearing that's implemented. And Mm -hmm. we talk about like the, you know, jokes and humor and stuff, but there is something to be said about the implementation of a, of a, of an F bomb or a shit or whatever swear. And this movie, I think a teacher of mine once said something along the lines of a well-placed fuck is very effective. Mm hmm. And how did you feel about this? Because this has, uh, you know, quite a lot of them. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't think I really noticed it too much. Like, there was the swearing, and I did mention that, like, when John Malkovich was emphasizing it, there was an element there, but that was also complemented by the fact that his reactions were always so big and kind of unexpected. Mine was with George after he shot Brad Pitt in the face. And he's just screaming, "What the fuck? Fuck! What the hell? Oh God, fuck me!" And just, just, and George Clooney's gurning performance. Well, of his, it. the physical element of that reaction was, yeah, what caught me. But I just him like, I shot a fucking spook. Just, oh fuck me! He's a fucking spook. Fuck me! He's just so upset about it. I guess I don't know what that word means. A spook. Thought, yeah, I we've, thought, we've was, done this on the podcast. Before. I think we have. We've had yeah. to explain this to you. You you did the. Uh, I, I knew it as a slur, as a racial slur, and yeah. I am like, no, it's a government. That's right, yeah. agent. And you're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's a, you know, yeah, we've done. Yeah, I remember done, we did. I can't remember what for. Let's say race to which mountain, just for good mm. measure. Let's say but thunderpants. Anything else you want to say about burn after reading? Uh, I mentioned to you before that uh, there was an actor in this film, like, oh, I know this guy. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I looked like, oh, it wasn't that guy. Like, halfway through the film, it was after John Malkovich got uh, the phone call from Brad Pitt about, you know, the blackmail. He went to this guy with glasses to... Oh, yes, when he gets served with divorce papers, that scene. Oh, yeah, that's that's what happens at the end of the scene. Um, And, yeah, he's telling him, like, why did he go to the Russians? Like, what's the point there? And the guy with the glasses, I thought that was Jerry Doyle. Oh, Garibaldi yeah. from Babylon 5. Who I think you've mentioned Garibaldi already this episode, so uh, yes. that was funny. Yes, we were talking a bit before we recorded about Babylon 5, and you were like, I think there's someone in that in this that I thought it was that person, but it wasn't. And I was like, Garibaldi is John Malkovich. I think that character's last line is also like a very, you know, sarcastic zinger. zinger. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of garibaldi I loved the Russians, by the way. <laughs> they were all so strange, their performances. That embassy, yeah, was lit different to the rest of the It was lit film. different. The set was different. Like, the <laughs> set design was like Very from big a... big room. It looked it... like it was Metropolis. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, was yes. like, it looked like we fucking entered a silent comedy film from like the 20s. Like, it was so... But that one Russian, the one she first talked to, like the really nerdy looking one... Mm. The he, Mac or PC? He, he, his physicality... He was like he was vibrating, like he's so rigid, but he had like this nervous kind of shake to him. He, oh my god, he was so good, and just every single Russian that we got to meet was a new level of like, oh, that's what a Russian is. And then the film chastises you for that, because then we cut to everyone else and like the Russians. Why would they go to the Russians? It's like looking at you, the audience. Why would you expect the Russians to be important in a story like this? That this makes no sense. The, yeah, they're basically like, this isn't the Cold War. Yeah. Forget the Russians you just met in the embassy that you, look yeah. like they're from one of those films that would be about this, mm. and they act strange. How dare you? Like, the, yeah. <laughs> And we haven't even done Crimea in the 2016 US election yet. Oh my god, <laughs> there was the picture of Vladimir Putin above, mm. and I'm like, ah, oh, nothing's changed. <laughs> nothing's changed. He's still winning the election. Good, fa- good on you, Vlad. Fairly and legally, of course. They all want him. We all do. I vote for him, and That's I'm not even from there. One of my dad's best friends, uh, we were hanging out one time, and he brought up, like, yeah, a lot of people say I look like Putin, and he really does. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a good Polish boy? He's or? a very good Polish. He's my sister's godfather. There you go. There you go. 
Uh, I'm trying to recall if there's any other things about Burn after reading. I, I guess as just a part of the Coen Brothers puzzle, I enjoy it as like a kind of a throwaway affair because like with, say, Miller's Crossing, for instance, they wrote Miller's Crossing and they hit a writer's block. And then because they hit a writer's block with Miller's Crossing, and that's a very complicated film, a lot of plot elements happening, a lot of double crosses and character stuff, they wrote Barton Fink, which is a movie about a writer with writer's block. With this, they were writing, uh, I think it was No Country for Old Men or something, at the same time. So every day, like one day they would do this, and then the other day they would do that. Like they would alternate days of writing a script for one and writing a script for another of like the two films. And I kind of like that energy of when the Coen brothers have, I guess, their we're just having a little bit of fun type thing of mm. of intolerable cruelty is like an example of like no one rates that as the best Coen brothers movie. But I enjoy it because it's different to a lot of their films, yet it's still very them. And same with Burn After Reading. It's very Coen Brothers, but it's also, you, you know, like, certain people wouldn't expect this type of film out of them all of the time because this is a, uh, you know, we've done a lot of uh, serious crime movies. and let's, let's just goof it up. Let's just have a goofy time. I think you calling this one a kind of throwaway affair is what I'm feeling as well. Like, I was just in it for the ride. Things were happening. I liked what was happening. I liked seeing everything fall into place together, even if it all led up to, you know, the film saying, like, this was nothing. Mm -hmm. This is a real Seinfeld movie. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, And like like what you were saying, like, the final scene is basically chastising the film for existing. It's like, oh, yeah, that's funny. That is. So I recommend Burn After Reading. Uh, It's very good. It it does have some little flourishes in terms of filmmaking stuff of the Coen brothers, but it's very subdued. It's not a very showy film. Say, like, with Big Lebowski. That's, you could say, is that one of their throwaway, let's have fun like that. That's what they followed up Fargo with. But Le- Big Lebowski is very show-offy in its filmmaking techniques and cinematography and just tricks, while this... There's not too much of that. The most you get is like you the zoom. Bo- yeah, you don't the, have the bowling scene. Yeah, you don't have the dream sequences. You don't have music. Like, they don't go absurd over the top with any of their set pieces, or let alone their, just how they place the camera. The most you get that stands out in my mind is the introduction or every time we cut to the CIA and it's like this top-down zoosh to the floor and we're following the footsteps hmm. and zooming through doors and stuff. That's the most show-offy I feel like they get in this film. Pretty much everything else is very laid back in a weird way, a very like, yep, you're watching this scene, huh? Hmm. Hmm? Aren't you enjoying that? All right, we're moving, we're moving on now. No wacky transitions, no big needle drops from them. This is... Just, just wanted to raise that before just saying, yeah, check out Burn After Reading. But for a Coen Brothers movie, this is a lot more, like, dialed back than some of their other stuff, which is good. You know, got to got to change things up every now and then. Would you recommend Burn After Reading? I do. I recommend it. I think this is just a fun film. Now it is your time mm-hmm. to tell us the film we will be watching and then discussing on the podcast. So what are we watching for the pod and what are we discussing? Yep, so I've had this film, <laughs> a bit of a journey trying to recommend this film. A couple of weeks ago, I'm like, oh yeah, maybe I'll recommend that film. Ah, oh, but it's an American film. Got to wait for my American pick. And then like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I completely forgot what the film was. Mm-hmm. And as we were getting closer to this day, I'm like, what was that film that I wanted to recommend? I remember it was kind of like an unexpected pick for me. What was it? Mm. And literally this morning, like 10 minutes before I left to come here, it just came back to me like, oh, thank God, I can recommend it now. Um, I was going to go with something else, but uh, this is what I'm going for. And it's uh, it's not a musical, but I thought it was. Yeah. So I guess it's kind of like musical adjacent for our year of the musical, which, by the way, everyone, 2024 is the Pictures Powell year of the musical. We've done several already, we so have. give us a break. I We've know. We've done at least four, four or five. I so. know, but it's the year. It's the Ryan. year of musicals. As Last year was the year of animation. Yes, that's true. 
Um, this is from a decade that I don't think I've picked a film from yet. It's not the oldest film I've picked. 1930s. 1930s. Here we go. No, we, no, no we, we're not doing Dracula. Okay. Um, no, I don't think I've recommended a 50s film yet. Oh, okay. I, Let's see what you're yeah. hitting us with. I think It's a Wonderful Life was 40s, right? I thought it was the 50s, but oh, maybe, we'll, maybe, we'll, maybe you're right, but keep going. Either way, this is a film from 1952. Uh, it is Sailor Beware. Okay, I don't know it, Sailor Beware. It is a Martin and Lewis film. Oh, okay. I think this is um, the first one from them I've seen. Oh, interesting. And to clarify, 1946 is It's a Wonderful Life. Right, so. yep. Mid forties, and so you have recommended us uh, Sailor Beware. Sailor Beware. Yeah. It's Martin a nineteen, Lewis. yeah, nineteen fifty two version. Jerry, oh wow! I, I mean, cool. We haven't done them on the podcast, but we haven't had either of them, have we? Yeah, I don't think so. We've probably we've probably heard a Martin song at some point, but and uh, Jerry Lewis gets referenced in a bunch of stuff. Mm. Uh, we haven't had him in anything yet. I mean. I don't know. Yeah, we wouldn't have. Interesting. Interesting to think about. Have we not? Not as like an old man in something? You would assume so, but I'm yeah. trying to recall if we've ever had either of them in anything, but this will be our chance to have them and as a duo as well, I must say. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it more next week, but they're, they're a duo I haven't seen much of yeah, me neither. their work together. I've seen them in individual projects, but together, not as frequent. So... We will be watching that, so everyone make sure to give it a viewing for yourself, and we shall be back next time to talk about Sailor... Beware. Beware. Just one sailor. Yeah, I actually remember the title as Sailor's Beware, but it's Sailor Beware. Sailor Moon. Beware of that's, Tuxedo that's, Mask. This is the inspiration for Sailor, sailor Moon. Moon. Which one's t Tuxedo Mask? Is that Jerry Lewis? I don't know. <laughs> I never, think that's Jerry Lewis. I've never watched Sailor Moon. You don't even know of Tuxedo Mask? No, I know who Tuxedo Mask so is. So you could have said, you know... I was being humble. Oh, you're, you're being humble. <laughs> what are you, George Clooney in a Coen Brothers film? <laughs> humbling yourself? Now... We can be found on the social medias of Facebook and Twitter under Spit and Polish Presents or Spit and Polish. Our, uh, our socials are included in the description of this episode, as is where you can email us. If you want to talk to us, let us know your thoughts and opinions on things we've discussed here, or you want to recommend a film to us, you can email us over at spitandpolished at gmail.com or just go through those social medias. Feel free to rate and review the podcast if you have the means to do so. If you're on Spotify, they have that little five-star thing there. If you're on Apple or several other podcasting sites, you can not only just rate the podcast, but you can leave a review. You can be us. We review stuff. You can review us reviewing stuff. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. I'd be delightful. I would be delighted. Now, Bartek, the podcast is over. What was the point? I don't know, just pay for the surgery. Okay. Fuck it, I guess. I guess, you know, w what I learned is we won't do it again. Mm. Whatever I, it was. Yeah. I don't think we mentioned that uh, she wanted the surgery in the film. It's fine. At any point in this episode. It's fine. So Characters had many motivations. It was a reference mention. to the film, everyone. It's Frances fine. Frances McDormand wanted plastic four, surgery. four plastic surgeries. She didn't want to get rid of the vaccine scar, though. She was very adamant about that for some reason. <laughs> uh we talked so much about the film, and yet it feels like we've missed so much. But what was the point? Who knows? Beware. Sailor. <laughs>